Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. You better make yourselves comfortable because we've got a long one today. Today I'm going to be telling you the story of Jim Jones, Jonestown and the mass suicide murder that took place, killing more than 900 Americans. I was really battling with myself as to whether this should be a part of my history series or my midweek mystery series. I had a very similar question when I covered Emmett Till a couple of weeks ago. But I've decided that anything involves sort of a big crime will usually be in my mystery series. Anything that's more like history story based will be in my history series. Not that I think many of you particularly mind either way, but I have got some questions about how I decide which video is where. So crime will generally come under the midweek mystery. There's question over the terminology that should be used when referring to Jonestown. Was it a mass murder or a mass suicide? Was it a massacre or simply a mass murder suicide? Jonestown resulted in the largest single loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act from 1978 up until the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. I'm going to do my best to tell the story of Jonestown in this video, but it is the kind of case that has hours upon hours of information to tell. Hopefully this video will give you the basic idea of what happened and how it came to happen, but if you're particularly interested in the subject, I would urge you to go and do some further reading. It's a real rabbit hole of information. So let's start by looking at the main man himself, Jim Jones. He was born James Warren Jones on the 13th of May 1931 in Crete, Indiana to James Thurmond and Lynetta Putnam Jones. James was a very distant father, he was 47 years old, he was an injured war veteran and he was frustratingly lazy according to his son and very unwilling to contribute to the world around him. Lynetta was the opposite of her husband. She was 17 years younger, she was vivacious, bubbly, intense. James couldn't or wouldn't work, leaving Lynetta to be the sole provider for the family by working at the local factory. When Jim was around three years old, the Great Depression was at its peak and the family were forced to move to Lynn, Indiana, where they lived in nothing more than just a shack, a barn. It didn't even have basic plumbing, it was the most basic of the basic. Lynetta would often leave Jim in the care of neighbours and babysitters. She was always working. He was described as somewhat of a feral child, just growing up by himself. He had interesting, very different relationships with both of his parents. Lynetta was a very liberal woman for her time. Her and Jim would often discuss the big questions about life over the dinner table, talking about the meaning of life, the universe. Lynetta wasn't particularly religious, at least not in the way that other people were, who she often scoffed at, but she always instilled it in her son that he was special. He had big things coming for him in life. She nagged him that he must make something of himself unlike his father. She preached love and acceptance to Jim, which was pretty much the opposite of his father James. Jim would later claim that his father James was associated with the KKK in Indiana. He was apparently a very deeply racist and hate-filled man. Years later, Jim would talk about how him and his father didn't speak for many years after he once refused to let one of Jim's black friends into the house. He would also be frequently beaten by his father, once because he brought his black friend home, another time because he brought a stray dog home and his father forced him to get rid of it, before beating him because there was no food for the animal. The complete opposite of Lynetta in every way, who also had this strong, intense hatred of any form of social inequality, saying it was the worst form of hypocrisy. People who knew Jim Jones in his childhood speak of him as being somewhat of a strange child. He would take his friends to the loft of his family's barn and force them to play with him. He would constantly take in stray animals, he would experiment on their bodies and then hold funerals for them when they inevitably died. A friend recalled in the 2006 documentary Jonestown, The Life and Death of People's Temple that Jim was obsessed with religion, he was obsessed with death. A friend of mine told me that he saw Jimmy kill a cat with a knife. He then later held a funeral for said murdered cat. Jim didn't have many friends. He seemed to scare the other children away for some reason. He was also a voracious reader from his childhood, probably because he didn't have many friends to entertain himself with. He read everything he could about big political and religious characters throughout history. He was obsessed with Stalin, Marx, Gandhi and Hitler. They were some of his chosen subjects. He was particularly fascinated by Hitler, and he would later say that when he was a very young boy, he strongly identified with the Soviets. He said on tape, when the Soviets were marching and news was praising them highly for their endurance and turning back the Nazi hordes in Stalingrad, I used to play as if I was a Russian soldier. Jim Jones preached racial and social equality. He seemingly cared for animals. He had friends from all races, all backgrounds, all classes. How does a man like that go on to do the things he did? How does a man like that go on to kill 909 people? 
The signs were there from a very young age. He seemed to have some kind of cognitive dissonance between his thoughts and his actions. He loved animals. He was devastated when his childhood dog died, but he would also experiment on their bodies and kill them just to hold a funeral. He would lock his childhood friends in the barn just to see how long it would take them to break out. He would later recall how he converted to socialism as a child, this big moment of realisation he had. He said, when I was laying on springs with no covers and the rain was pouring through the roof of my old ramshackle house and they told me to pray to God, there was no God that came. The rain kept pouring, I had a beam of consciousness. I said there shouldn't be any poor, there shouldn't be any private property. He basically had nothing and he prayed to God and he still had nothing. So it was around this time, he said around the age of five, that he realised socialism was the answer. Or at least the idea of socialism, I doubt a five year old boy would know that level of terminology. This would be the basis for everything he was going to do with his life. Eventually Lynetta and James split and Jim moved with his mother to Richmond, Indiana. In December 1948 he graduated early from Richmond High School with honours. Before this though, at 16 years old, he gets a full-time job working nights at the Reed Memorial Hospital in Richmond. Here he meets a 20-year-old nurse called Marceline Boswell and the two become sweethearts. They start dating and Marceline mirrored all of Jim's own ideas about life. She was always the underdog, she was a generous person, always willing to give to the less fortunate. When she received her first paycheck from the hospital, she gave a portion of it to a local widow with 10 children. She was described as a kind woman, always helping others. It was no surprise to anyone that Jim went to work at a hospital. His classmates at Richmond High School would call him Doc. He was a very quiet, reserved individual. He was smart. Everyone thought that he was going to be a doctor, as he talked in medical terms all the time. His yearbook literally stated, Jim's six syllable medical vocabulary astounds us all. Imagine how different the world would be if he had gone on to be a doctor as everyone expected. I don't think it was long after his graduation that he ended up marrying Marceline. Everyone thought they were a perfect match, they complemented one another perfectly. And everyone commented about how Marcy was now a lot more self-confident, she was happier in herself. The two moved to Bloomington, Indiana, where Jim attended Indiana University Bloomington. A couple of years later, they moved to Indianapolis, where he attended Indiana University for two years before switching to night classes. He eventually earned his degree in 1961, 10 years after enrolling. The beginning of the end started in Indianapolis. He began attending gatherings of the Communist Party USA once he was there. I mean, is it really a surprise that he agreed with the teachings of communism? It's really not. He identified himself as a Marxist though. Marxism is based on the political and economic theories of Karl Marx, later developed by followers to form the basis of communism. In a very basic definition, it's a way of organising society in which workers own their own means of production. It's a thought process which focuses on the struggle between the social classes, specifically between the bourgeoisie or the capitalist and the proletariat or the workers. That the relationship between the capitalists and the workers were inherently exploitative and would create class conflict. There's a whole lot more to it than that, that's a whole video in itself I'm sure, but that's basically what Marxism is. Jim realised that the best way in which he could get a platform to share his views was to infiltrate the church. He saw communists being persecuted openly in the United States on a daily basis at this point and he didn't like it. He was a known communist yet he didn't find it hard to find a place within the church. In 1952 he became a student pastor at the Somerset Southside Methodist Church. Now people have a lot of differing opinions on whether Jim was actually religious or not, whether he saw himself as a Christian man or if he just saw the church as an opportunity to have a platform. He kind of thought himself as a godlike figure, he claimed that he was God and that others should follow him. He claimed to be clairvoyant later in life but he had divine prophetic powers. He admitted these powers were not divine in any religious sense, that he was simply more physically involved than the rest of humanity. Like These are things that Jim generally thought about himself. And therefore he thought he had access to a higher paranormal dimension. Marceline herself said in a 1977 interview with the New York Times that Jim hadn't been lured to the ministry by deep religious faith, but because it served his goal of achieving social change through Marxism. She said, Jim used religion to try and get people out of the opiate of religion. He once slammed a bible on the table and said, I've got to destroy this paper idol. But whilst that's likely how he felt privately, he sure would have been religious through and through in front of his congregation. Jim soon left his position at the Somerset Church though, as he fell out with his leaders when they barred him from letting black people into his congregation. 
This was 1950s America, of course, and segregation was still in full force. He declared that he was outraged at racial discrimination within the church and said that he was going to establish his own church that was open to people of all races. He was very socially aware, but to raise money to open his church, he imported monkeys and sold them door to door as pets, which is not so socially aware. He opened the People's Temple as a middle of the road Protestant denomination church in which he preached apostolic socialism, which is basically socialism, but through a religious lens. As you can imagine, he was incredibly criticised in Indiana at the time for his integrationist views. A lot of the white community openly disliked him. And this is where things get a little bit morally confusing, because for all intents and purposes, you can look at Jim Jones at this point in his life through the lens of 2020 and think that he was a good, kind, decent person. He fought for rights even when people openly opposed him. He helped to racially integrate Indianapolis churches, restaurants, theatres, the police department, the hospital. When swastikas were painted on the homes of two black families, he walked through the neighbourhood comforting the distraught black families. He set up sting operations to catch restaurants refusing to serve black customers. When he accidentally ended up in the black ward of the hospital after a collapse and doctors realised their mistake and tried to move him, he refused to move. This eventually led to the entire hospital desegregating their wards. And the People's Temple faced a lot of backlash for this, threats, offensive graffiti, potential bombs, but he stood by it all. There is reason for argument though that Jim may have been responsible for more than one of these attacks on himself, trying to draw attention to the church. The message of the church was social equality and racial justice. He donated money to charities, he ran social and medical programs for the needy, he fed the homeless, he ran drug rehabilitation and legal aid services. The People's Temple attracted a diverse group of followers, all races, all sexualities, all walks of life. But it mostly appealed to young people, people who saw the unfairness in America and wanted to do something, to make a change, do something meaningful with their lives. Interestingly though, one of Jim's things later became that he was the only heterosexual on earth, everyone else was gay. Anybody who showed any kind of interest in the opposite sex was just overcompensating. Whilst Jim was very sympathetic to people of the races, he did struggle with gay people. He referred to his temple as a rainbow temple, accepting of all, and his family was also called a rainbow family. Him and Marceline adopted several non-white children, something that wasn't commonly done at the time. They adopted three Korean American children, Lou, Suzanne and Stephanie, a Native American girl called Agnes, and they were the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child, Jim Jr. They adopted a white boy named Tim and had a biological child as well, who they named Stephen Gandhi. This was a time when things like this weren't the norm. A white family adopting a black child was unheard of. People who supported Jim Jones's cause really supported him, and the people who didn't, really didn't. Stephen later said about his childhood, I lived in a community that was filled with every walk of life, every colour in the rainbow, every level of education. For the most part, we lived in harmony most of the time, especially early on. It was not fake. I'm so grateful for that because it showed me the truth of that, the beauty of that, the importance of that. So I love that about him. But eventually, it became all superficial. Stephen said there was nothing spiritual about his father, that he eventually lost sight of everything that made him a good man. Because Jim Jones wasn't a good man at his core, he seemed to lose sight of it all. By the 70s, he would often claim to literally be black himself. He claimed that he was Native American, he literally wasn't, he was just white. It could be claimed nowadays that he had a white saviour complex, a white person who acts to help non-white people, but in a way that could be perceived as self-serving. I think the argument around that is a lot more nuanced though when we're talking about the 1950s, because it was a very different world. But there was definitely something self-serving about the way Jim Jones treated his church and his congregation. He had an end goal, which was socialism. He realised the political value of a large religious congregation and the power that held. He had Indiana's politicians in his pocket. He realised that he could persuade his large congregation to vote as a bloc on the social issues that interested him. And the political leaders very much noticed this. In 1961, he applied for the job of Indianapolis Human Relations Commissioner and he got it. It was thought that being a pastor, he could pacify businesses that were discriminating in a calm and unemotional way. And he delivered on this. The people at the city council really liked him. So Jim having this large congregation, attracting people who weren't welcome in other churches, really did benefit him. It benefited his quest of power. 
Jim also realised the money that laid behind faith healing services in the church, something which was huge around this time. He knew that healings were a great way to draw people to the temple for the first time. It was a way to draw them in and hope that they'd stay. Jim would claim he had a special power, a gift, and he'd heal members of his congregation, everything from physical to mental ailments. But how did he do it? Well, it was all fake, of course. He had his trusted members of the congregation who would fake ailments and participate willingly, perform for the visitors. It was for the greater good, they thought. The more people drawn into the temple, the more people that would hear the message of building a better world. He would mimic people like Father Divine, a very famous preacher, who operated under a very similar system and is often also considered to be a cult leader today. Father Divine claimed to be God and also focused on racial equality and social justice, although he was actually a black man. At some point after the death of Father Divine, Jim Jones claimed to be his reincarnation, even though he was 34 years old at the time. He claimed to heal cancer, in which he would send Marceline into a toilet stall with an old woman, and they would emerge holding a foul-smelling tumoresque item in a napkin, a past cancer tumour apparently. People believed it, but it was just a small piece of meat, chicken gizzards. There was also a time when Jim claimed to heal himself, one evening in 1970 or 1971, just before a planned preaching trip to Seattle, Jim left his house and he was shot. There was blood everywhere reportedly, people were screaming and crying. People picked him up and helped him into his house and just a few minutes later he walked out with a clean shirt on saying he'd healed himself. Of course, he'd never been shot at at all, it was just a carefully planned ruse. In 1962, Jim read an article in Esquire magazine, which listed the nine safest places in the world in the event of a nuclear catastrophe. He had been thinking and preaching a lot recently about the impending nuclear war, warning his congregation of an attack that was going to happen on July 15th, 1967. He knew, of course, because he had special powers, he was a divine being. Now you've got to remember that this was in the midst of the Cold War, and a lot of people around the world had probably justifiable concerns about a nuclear attack. It was something that was at the back or the forefront of everyone's minds. Jim Jones is a very paranoid and power-hungry man, which is a not-so-great combination. He wanted everyone to think like him. One of the cities cited as safe in the Esquire article was Eureka, California, which was stated as being safe because it is west of the Sierras and upwind from every target in the United States. So Jim decided that his entire congregation needed to move to California for their own safety. He was convinced that the world was going to be engulfed by a nuclear war and that if him and his congregation were safe, they could lead a new interracial world. So the temple begins moving to Redwood Valley, California. For all of this time, Jim Jones would be preaching his beliefs under the guise of religion, Christianity. Everything had a religious angle, but as we know, he was never all that religious. Members of his congregation even referred to him as father. He referred to himself as father. Originally in the sense of him being a church leader, but as the People's Temple merged into more of a cultesque thing, the meaning of father changed to dad. People literally started calling him dad. He was the caretaker, or at least he was supposed to be. Once the People's Temple was set up in California, Jim Jones continues carving himself a very good reputation. He was intelligent and friendly, a kind man in search of a better world. In 1966, he was appointed chairman of the county great jury. The judge who appointed him said that he was very bright, he was a humanistic person. He didn't seem to be socialist. He said the People's Temple were nice, concerned people. Their most significant characteristic was that they wanted to come to the aid of everyone in trouble. The judge said that Jones wasn't a fanatic when he knew him, although people were definitely emotionally dependent on him. The people in his community built their entire lives around Jones and his church. In 1970, Jim decided that his message needed to be preached beyond Redwood Valley, and the next year they bought another church in San Francisco and then another in Los Angeles. The People's Temple was all across California and claimed almost 20,000 members at its peak. But people weren't entirely happy. Jim was starting to go off the rails a little bit and they were paying attention. There had long been rumours, even as far back as Indiana, that Jim was convincing members of his congregation to sell their houses to raise money for the church. Only weirdly, this money would end up in his own personal bank account, not the church's. His sermons at this point would go on for entire days, six hours or more. He was obsessed with the idea of sex, that he was the only true heterosexual and sex was inherently negative. But he was having sex with members of his congregation. He kept the members so tired, so overworked, they didn't even have time to make complaints. 
The church became their whole lives and therefore if they complained and left, they wouldn't have anywhere else to go. These people were trapped. Members were expected to attend two, three, even four services a week, which would often run all through the night until sunrise. Jim would hold what he called catharsis sessions, in which members would have to criticise, humiliate a chosen person who would be on the floor, the centre of their attention. It was all a concept to keep the members in line. Over time, the catharsis sessions got worse and eventually the sessions began to include physically beating people with a large wooden paddle and also boxing matches. By this time, the People's Temple at its peak, Jim Jones was growing increasingly paranoid. He was becoming unrecognisable, a horrible, paranoid man. Any criticism of himself or the church was a deep, personal affront. One church member described him as going from a beautiful Christian man to a Jekyll and Hyde, a monster. It was around this time that his true beliefs started to come out in front of his congregation, his Marxism, his support of Hitler and Lenin. He spoke often of how good he was at sex, that all women should think that he was making love to them, not their husbands. But also no one was allowed to have sex until they got to the promised land. But then if a woman couldn't raise any money to give him, he'd literally tell her to go out and sell herself on the streets. On December 13th, 1973, Jim was arrested in the Hollywood cinema on a lewd conduct charge after an undercover police officer said that he'd tried to molest him. The charge was later dropped, but regardless, the arrest happened. He was just a very dodgy, dodgy guy at this point. The very same month that he was arrested was when he'd actually first sent a small number of church members to Guyana to scout locations for an agricultural commune he had been planning. Despite the fact that it was obvious that Jim was slowly losing it, his social and political power only grew. The best way to put it is that the politicians licked his ass. He could deliver thousands of people's votes on any topic he wanted. If you were a politician in California and you wanted a guaranteed vote on a particular subject, you could count on Jim to deliver. He was one of the most powerful political, non-political figures in California at the time. It's estimated that he could control nearly 16% of the vote in his area, Mendocino County. If a politician wanted to win a vote, then they simply had to have Jim on their side. He had so many people hanging on to his every single word. And as Jim's power grew, so did the church. Each member would have to donate money, a percentage of their income, and they did so, sometimes willingly, sometimes out of fear, because people were scared of Jim Jones and what he'd become. In the summer of 1977, the first critical report on the People's Temple was released in the media, in the form of an article written by New West magazine. Jim Jones lost his shit. And actually, it might be more accurate to call it a scathing expose than just an article. It was entitled Inside People's Temple, written by Marshall Kilduff and Phil Tracy. It was mostly based on interviews with disaffected ex-members of the church, the cult, I should say. Because I think by this point in time, we could probably accurately call it a cult rather than a church. The article is actually super interesting. I'll make sure to link it in the description box so you can have a read of it if you wish. The article writes that when it became known that New West was researching an article on the People's Temple, the magazine, its editors and the advertisers were subjected to a bizarre letter and telephone campaign. The offices were receiving as many as 50 phone calls and letters a day, all from temple members and supporters, as well as prominent Californian leaders and politicians. The messages were very much the same throughout. It was, don't attack Jim Jones, he's a good man who does good work. Not that this deterred the writers though, and they just dug deeper, they were very intrigued. This was a church that had a very cult-like following. Jim Jones would be surrounded by up to 15 bodyguards everywhere he went, and the People's Temple had two sets of locked doors, guards patrolling the aisles during services, and a band of passerbys dropping in unannounced on a Sunday morning. The leader praised the Nazis, but the congregation was 80 to 90% black. What on earth was going on? A lot of what I've already covered in this video comes from this article, as the writers managed to get ex-members to speak. They spoke of all the night services, the classes sessions, the beatings with a large wooden panel. During the regularly scheduled family meetings and services came to be called, up to 100 people at the thousand strong congregation would be lined up to be paddled for their wrongdoings. Even a minor infraction such as not being attentive enough during a sermon was enough to earn you a beating. Members would be forced to write letters incriminating themselves in illegal and immoral acts that never even happened. Most people interviewed for the articles gave the very same story. They joined the church being pulled in by the loving atmosphere, the compassionate nature of Jim Jones, but slowly this gave away to cruelty. 
After a beating, either physical or mental, in front of the congregation, Jim would come over and put his arms around the person and say, I realise that you went through a lot, but it was for the cause. Father loves you and now you're a stronger person. I can trust you now you've gone through this and accepted the discipline. Early beatings included the use of a belt, which was then replaced by a paddle, which was then replaced by a large board, which was dubbed the Board of Education. At first, only adults would be punished, but then the children would be too. The amount of times they would be struck started at 12, but eventually the number went all the way up to 100. Elmer and Deanne Myrtle were two members interviewed for the article, or two ex-members, I should say. They explained how they rationalised the beatings at first. The punished child or adult would always thank Jim afterwards, and then Jim would point out how much better they were now. In their heads, Jim must have been doing the right thing because it caused people to better themselves and they would literally thank him. It was only when their daughter was called up to be disciplined because she'd been seen hugging and kissing a female friend she hadn't seen for a long time that they see things with more clarity. Jim accused their daughter of being a lesbian, a punishable offence apparently. She was 16 years old and beaten on her buttocks 75 times for simply greeting a friend. But the family stayed for another year simply because they had nothing outside of the church. They'd given the church all of their money and their property and they'd given up their jobs. Jim Jones would trap people into a corner until they had nothing, nowhere else to go. The People's Temple became their entire lives, it was their family. Each working member was expected to pay 25% of their earnings to the church, something that was called the commitment. If you couldn't meet the commitment, you're expected to find ways to make it, like baking cakes to sell or making jewellery. They were told that the money was needed to build up the promised lands, so they'd have another place to go whenever the fascists destroyed them like they did the Jews. Jim would tell them that the black people would end up in concentration camps under this new fascist rule that was coming, and they would do them like the Jews in the gas ovens. And the people hung on to his every single word. People believed him when he said this. The promised land spoken of here is Guyana, a project Jim had been working on for a number of years. It was apparently to be an agricultural project. Jim dreamed of a place to create a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from the media scrutiny back in California. He intended to establish it as a model communist community, saying that the temple compromised of the purest communists there are. But in reality, it was just an attempt to gather more control. People were defecting from the temple at this time at a very high rate, and they weren't happy with the way they were being treated. Jonestown was intended to be a place that nobody could leave. Jim had plans to relocate his entire congregation to Guyana. But why Guyana, of all places? Well, for one, it was English-speaking, so it was just easier. It also had a large black population and, at the time, had a socialist government. Jim came to an agreement with the Guyanese government that benefited them both. Jonestown was located in the northwest of Guyana, in an area which Venezuela had claimed in the past, and was still very much in dispute between the two countries. If a community of a thousand Americans were living there, the Guyanese Prime Minister knew that Venezuela would be very unlikely to try and take the land back. They'd be stupid to constitute a threat to the citizens of one of the most powerful countries in the world, America. Jonestown was an area of 3,852 acres leased to the People's Temple by the Guyanese government for what was supposed to be 25 years. It was leased on the basis that People's Temple could cultivate and beneficially occupy at least one-fifth of the land within the first two years, starting in 1974. The members were to clear the dense jungle and start an agricultural project and grow a number of tropical fruits and vegetables. It was meant to be this paradise slowly built up over a number of years. But with rumours of this scathing article about to be released, Jim moved ahead with his plans to relocate everyone to Guyana. A number of his most trusted people had been sent over there much earlier to begin cultivating the land, but the majority were sent over in the late summer of 1977. It had been in the works for months. People needed passports, visas, immunisations, as well as time to sell their houses, etc. So the New West article wasn't a thing that made them leave, it was just a catalyst that made Jim get people over there a little bit faster. There was this sudden urgency just to get everyone over there. The original plan was to send people down in groups of 50 to 100 at a time to give the community a chance to grow with them, build housing, allow food and livestock to grow. Instead, 1,000 people all arrived at once and they immediately found themselves in a situation where they couldn't provide even the most basic services to people. 
from the beginning there wasn't enough housing or food or just enough self-sustainability in general. It was doomed from the day they set foot there. Jonestown has been described by members who managed to escape as something akin to a prison camp, located in an incredibly isolated part of the world. Even if you wanted to leave, you couldn't. There was no way to. It was entirely self-sustained, which meant a lot of hard work, and the conditions were unforgiving. The ground wasn't ideal for growing crops, and the weather was really hot. A lot of the time the commune was played with illnesses as well. Disease would spread like wildfire. Members were encouraged to snitch on each other if they'd heard whisper of someone disagreeing with the rules or thinking of defecting. For some, though, they still thought it was a great life. One woman who survived was Laura Johnson, and she told the BBC, My work there was meaningful and fulfilling. The people of People's Temple were who I wanted to live my whole life with. They were wonderful people. Other survivors might say differently, but for me, I was delighted. It was not an unhappy part of my life. Things started to go downhill for Jim Jones after the move to Jonestown. His authority decreased because people simply didn't need as much control anymore. Just being at Jonestown without their passports and with guards with guns in watchtowers watching their every move was kind of control enough. They had no choice but to comply with the life they now lived. It wasn't so much Jim's influence that forced them to do so, they just had to do it to survive. His voice was no longer needed to recruit new members and everyone was just stuck. Jim also had one hell of a drug addiction, and being in such a small place with so many other people made it very hard to hide. Everyone knew about it. He abused pharmaceutical drugs, and he relied on the help of the Jonestown medical staff to keep his addiction fed. He would take stimulants such as amphetamine to get himself going in the morning, and sometimes in the night, and barbiturates like pentobarbital to help him sleep. His later autopsy found levels of pentobarbital within the toxic range, which was enough to cause an overdose and death in any normal person. The fact that this amount hadn't led to an overdose showed that his body had gained a tolerance to the drug due to the years and years of abuse. Whilst at Jonestown, Jim recorded a number of self-tapes, just him talking about himself and his world and his vision, and it becomes quite clear as time goes on through these tapes that he's more and more drugged. As time went on, Jim Jones became more and more erratic. He begins to hold what he called white nights, a term which was used to denote a crisis within the temple and the possibility of mass death as a result of the crisis. Different former members of the temple say there are a different number of white night drills held. Some say there are only two or three, others describe them as happening every week, others say pretty much every night. And this confusion does make sense because there were different levels of the drills. Sometimes Jones would evoke the word white night on a weekly basis to keep the community up all night to talk about problems and concerns. Others say they classed white nights as the nights in which they would have to come up to the microphone to pledge their willingness to die for the temple and its cause. Others say there are only two or three occasions on which the community would have a white night. They'd have to arm themselves with weapons and stay up alert for days at a time, on alert for an attack from the Guyanese Defence Force. For Jim Jones, it was very important that each and every member of the community would be willing to die for their cause, be willing to fight for the People's Temple. Sometimes at these white nights, the idea of mass suicide would be discussed. There were loudspeakers all over the compound, which played the voice of Jim Jones almost incessantly, 24-7. A lot of time it wasn't live, it was just his taped recordings being played back. But sometimes he'd go on to speaker and call out, white night, white night, get to the pavilion, run, your lives are in danger. He would expect everyone to stop what they're doing and run. He would then tell them that in the USA, the African Americans were being herded into concentration camps and there was genocide on the streets. He'd say that people were coming right this second to kill and torture them. He'd literally organise the higher members to go into the jungle and start shooting guns to make everyone feel like they were actually under attack. And of course, people didn't know they weren't under attack. On one of these occasions, a couple of women brought out trays of what they said was cyanide laced Kool Aid, telling everyone to drink it. People were expected to willingly die for the temple. If people didn't drink it, they would be forced to. So people drank the Kool Aid, but no one would die, and each time Jim would start laughing and clapping their hands, telling them it was just a rehearsal, and now he knew who he could trust. You're probably wondering how on earth Jim Jones could get away with this, but the truth is that very few people outside of the commune were paying attention. But in 1978, reports of widespread abuse and human rights violations at Jonestown had begun to filter out of Guyana. Some people were managing to escape, and the word was slowly getting out. 
A man called Bob Houston was found dead, mutilated near train tracks on October 5th, 1976, just three days after a taped telephone conversation with his ex-wife in which they discussed him leaving the temple. He talks about leaving the temple and then he's found dead. A little bit weird. The father of Bob Houston just happened to be friends with a congressman called Leo Ryan. The story of Bob roused Leo's interest and he began to pay close attention to any stories coming out of Guyana about this so-called Jonestown. His interest was further piqued by the story of a custody battle over a child called John Victor Stone. John was the son of Timothy and Grace Stone. Tim had become an integral member of the People's Temple years earlier, after it was suggested that he ask the group to help renovate the Mendocino County Legal Aid Office, so two dozen Temple volunteers turned up a week later to help him. Tim was impressed at what a good person Jim Jones and his congregation seemed to be, and he slowly integrated himself into the Temple, providing free legal aid for them. He was an avid member of the community and his wife Grace also became a member but she wasn't as in it as her husband was. And when they eventually went on to have their son John on January 25th 1972, Tim did something a little bit strange. On February 6th he signed a document claiming that he was not the real father of John but Jim Jones was. In the affidavit he said that he had entreated Jones to father a child with Grace because he himself could not and because Jim was the most compassionate, honest and courageous human being the world contains. To this day no one is entirely sure of what the true paternity of John was. Was Tim really his father but was so indoctrinated that he signed his son over to this temple or was Jim actually the father? We know that Jim had many sexual dalliances with lots of his temple members, but Grace denied that Jim was a father and would get beaten for it. In July 1976, Grace fleed the temple, leaving her son behind. He was being raised communally by the temple as a whole, as a lot of the children were. And she said that while she was frightened for her own well-being, she wasn't for her sons because he was looked after well. But I'm also sure that she knew with the affidavit stating that Jim was a father, there wasn't much she could do, she couldn't take John away. But the next year the temple migrates over to Jonestown and Grace realises that she has to get her son back otherwise he's gone forever. Tim had also recently defected from the temple and joined her in the battle to get their son back. It started in August 1977 with a legal declaration in which Grace attacked Jim Jones and the People's Temple, hoping that the court would side with her. Jim fired back with another affidavit that claimed that Grace was emotionally and mentally unstable. There was court hearing after court hearing, letters written to Jim requesting that he relinquish custody, but he refused. A Californian court eventually awarded custody of John to Grace and the DA requested Guyanese help to enforce this order. There were two court dates in Georgetown, Guyana's capital, which Jim did not attend. A Guyanese marshal visited Jonestown to serve this notice, nailing it to the door that he had to return John. The fear of losing John and being forced to hand him over meant that Jim didn't actually leave Jonestown for many months before his death, even though he was pretty ill, he needed medical attention. John would never leave Jonestown either, and he ended up dying along with the rest. But back to Leo Ryan. So he was one of the congressmen who helped the Stones in the battle to get their son back. He was also one of 91 congressmen to write to the Guyanese Prime Minister on the Stones' behalf, and he got very involved with mysteries surrounding Jonestown. Around this time, the American public became more and more aware of the agricultural project. The media was cottoning on and articles began popping up everywhere. Horrible news was coming out about the mistreatment and abuse that was going on over there. After reading an article in the San Francisco Examiner and hearing the pleas of concerned relatives of members, Leo Ryan declared that he was going to go to Jonestown. This was despite the fact that the government's own Department of State repeatedly stonewalled his attempts to find out what was going on over there. We all know that Jim Jones has some strong political connections and the Department of State probably are in on that. On November 1st, 1978, Leo Ryan announced that he was going to visit Jonestown, finally. There was initially to be a group consisting of just Leo's staff and a few members of press, but soon others joined, including 17 concerned relatives of Temple members. There were over 20 of them in total. He felt that it was his responsibility to go and see the true conditions people were living in in Jonestown and free the captives. 
He knew the trip was possibly dangerous before he made it, but he felt like it was his duty to help. The group landed in Georgetown on November 14th, 1978. The morning after their arrival, Leo Ryan, Jim Shollett, and Jackie Spear attended a briefing at the US Embassy in Guyana, where they were shown a slideshow of photos of their visit to Jonestown the previous May. Seemingly staged photos of everyone looking happy and joyful, large meals and exuberant church sessions. Everyone at the embassy was clearly a fan of Jim Jones. On November 17th, they headed to Jonestown to see for themselves, landing at a tiny airstrip at Port Katuma. A few temple members waited to accompany them to the compound, climbing into the rusty truck for the six mile journey. They had to be transferred in multiple trips, there just weren't enough vehicles for everyone. At the compound, Jim Jones greeted them with a handshake and took them on a tour of the commune. Highlighting, of course, all the best aspects. There were many cabins, a medical centre, a school, and a large pavilion where the preaching would be done. It was clear that many people were sleeping in each cabin. People didn't have their own, like, rooms or own spaces. Jackie Spear wrote later that it struck her that the majority of temple members were black, but the leadership was almost exclusively white. There was a definite power imbalance there, but nobody seemed to realise it. Leo and Jackie would request for temple members to come and talk to them one or two at a time, attempting to locate and speak to the individuals whose family members had been looking for them. But no one showed any interest in receiving correspondence from back home, and none of them expressed a desire to leave. They all swore that Jonestown was their one and only home. But weirdly, each speech sounded the same, very choreographed, very planned. With them, they had an NBC News correspondent called Don Harris. At one point, Don wanders off to smoke a cigarette, at which point a man follows him and slips a folded piece of paper into his hand before disappearing into the crowd. The note read, Vernon Gosney and Monica Bagby, please help us get out of Jonestown. Soon after, another member comes forward claiming that many temple members are desperately wanting to leave, but they're too scared. Don goes back to the congressman and passes over the note, and they had to decide what to do next, deciding to keep a low profile, at least for the moment. Jackie speaks to Monica Bagby, one of the names on the note, and she confirms that she wants to leave. So Monica runs back to her cabin to pack, as Jackie seeks out other people who wanted to leave as well, taking down all the names. Soon she had a list of more than 40 people who wanted to leave. She takes recorded affidavits of each person's wish to return back to the United States, even though by this point, Jim Jones was very aware of what was going on, it wasn't subtle anymore. He was being interviewed by Congressman Ryan at this time. He was all love and light when the camera was on and full of threats and hate as soon as they turn off. But of course he couldn't stop these people from leaving, especially in front of the camera crews, because that just looked a little bit culty. So many people wanted to leave that they actually had to call Georgetown to request an extra plane. They would have to make multiple trips to and from the airstrip, Leo saying that he's going to stay back to make sure that every person who wanted to leave was able to. Only suddenly there's commotion that begins in the pavilion and Leo is attacked with a knife. A temple member holding one to his throat threatens to kill him. So Leo decides it's probably best to join on the journey to the airstrip and just travel back and forth. He's in danger at Jonestown. So as one group waits behind, packed and ready to go, the truck with Leo and the rest all leave. Something that struck Jackie is very strange though, that there was a man on the truck called Larry Layton. And he was very high up in the organisation, he was one of the true believers through and through. And he just sat there for the entire journey saying nothing, he didn't really seem like he wanted to leave. Once they reach Port Katuma, the defectors are ushered onto the plane, as a large red tractor rolls onto the airstrip. The people on the tractor were Jonestown's armed guards, so-called Red Guards. They begin shooting in every direction and Larry Layton draws out his gun on the people who are already on the plane. Five people were killed in the shooting. Leo Ryan, NBC reporter Don Harris, NBC cameraman Bob Brown, San Francisco Examiner photographer Greg Robinson and Temple member Patricia Parks. Jackie Spear was shot five times but she managed to survive along with many other people who were injured. They lay there for almost 22 hours after the ambush until the plane arrives for help. But in those 22 hours, another tragedy had also taken place. Jim Jones had called his final white night and 909 bodies had been found at Jonestown in and around the pavilion, 304 of them children, all dead from cyanide poisoning. The FBI later found a 45 minute audio recording of the suicide in progress. Jones tells the temple members that intelligence organisations are conspiring against the temple and they are about to descend and torture them and their children. 
the entire group needed to commit revolutionary suicide. On the recording, you can hear people crying, people arguing. It wasn't necessarily something that everyone was down for. They were provided with a Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. Parents were told to give the drink first to their children and then to drink their own. Families were told to lie down together and wait to die. Some people say the temple members might not have known it through all this time. That's why so many people actually drank the Kool-Aid. But escaped members disagree with this. They probably did know that it was for all this time. Some would have, of course, fully believed in the cause, but others would have simply been too scared of Jim not to comply. Jim Jones was found dead on the floor himself, a gunshot wound to his head, which was consistent with suicide. I'm going to include a photo here of the scene of all the bodies. It's not graphic, you can't see detail, but I think it's important to include this so you have an understanding, an idea of the scale of this. So many people were dead. There's some debate around this being referred to as a mass suicide. Some may have consumed the poison voluntarily, of course, but others were coerced, murdered against their will. This was a community in which people have been slowly beaten down, physically and mentally, year after year. 300 children died, all of whom would have had no idea what was going on. The elderly were told that if they ever tried to escape, they would end up dying deaths alone in the depths of the jungle. They were nowhere near civilization here. It was either die with the crowds, end up alone in the middle of nowhere, with no means of contacting anyone for help, surrounded by death. Some did manage to escape, running into the jungle, but many were actually found shot on the outskirts. These were clearly people who were trying to escape, but were caught by the guards. There was also a pile of syringes at the scene. People who did not cooperate were held down and injected with the poison. It was a mass murder with some suicides. The People's Temple started as a place of equality, a place where all races could come together and be loved, at least that's what it was advertised as. Jim Jones took in the most downtrodden people in society under the guise of love and he broke their trust. He controlled them in every way possible. It's hard to fathom one man having that level of power, but it's important to remember the time in which this happened. The People's Temple began when segregation was very much still a thing. An idea of community where race didn't matter was very appealing to people, especially good people who were trying to make a difference in the world, just trying to find their place. And Jim Jones abused that trust that these people, mostly black people, put in him. I think by the end of it, even Jim Jones didn't believe what he was preaching anymore. He didn't believe in integrating the races. He didn't believe in equality. He didn't believe in Marxism or communism. He just went a little bit crazy or a lot crazy with that power that he had. For some people, power is really, really toxic. And he had this way of talking to people. He had this way of making people fall in love with him. And people couldn't see past that because he didn't give them anything else. He took everything away from these people and didn't give them anything in return. It's really easy to look at things like this as an outsider and think, how on earth do people ever get themselves in that position? How on earth do you find yourself as part of a mass suicide? But I think it's something that happens so gradually, it happens so slowly. You join thinking you're as part of this lovely church where everyone's loved, there's so much compassion, and then Day by day, month by month, it just slowly morphs into something else and you don't even realise it's happening. And that's scary because that could happen to pretty much anyone and then you find yourself in a position where you can't escape because you've got nothing else. I know this is a little bit different from the usual thing I cover but I found it really interesting to look into. If there's any other cults that you want me to have a look at then please let me know. I'm really like fascinated by this now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.